Good morning and welcome to worship here on the first Sunday of 2021. As we prepare our hearts for worship and entering into a time of singing and looking into the scriptures together, I want to thank you for being part of this virtual worship service. While we are waiting for a few minutes for more folks to join us and to log on to the service, I just want to continue to remind you that we appreciate all those of you who are sending in uh, your gifts and giving to the church as we continue to do ministry here through Hudson Wesleyan Church even during this time of pandemic. You can do that through HudsonWesleyan.org slash give as many of you have been doing. You can also send those gifts into the P.O. Box which is number 67 here in Hudson. One quick word that I just want to re uh, let you know about uh, regarding the giving. If you have sent checks to the church uh, in the last couple of weeks and you've noticed maybe they haven't cleared your checking account yet, um, it's just because with leading up to the holidays and the busyness then of Christmas and us not having weekly uh, in-person services, um, not all of those have gone through yet. This coming week they should uh, all get deposited into the bank, so I don't want you to worry about that. Um, I haven't been as available, Kathy hasn't been quite as available, but we are working on it and those uh, uh, bookkeeping details should all be taken care of this week. Appreciate your patience in that. Uh, wait with us just a couple of minutes and then we will begin our worship service together. Hello everyone, glad to see you here for worship today. Let's get started with a call to worship from Psalm 95. This is Psalm 95, verses 1 through 5. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Let's worship. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears. All nature sings and around me rings The music of the spheres This is my Father's world I rest me in the thought Of rocks and trees, of skies and seas His hands a wonders roll My father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white to clear. 
play the maker's place This is my father's world He shines in all that's fair In the rustling grass I hear him pass He speaks to me everywhere my father's world oh let me never forget that though the wrong seems off so strong god is the ruler yet this is my father's world the battle is not time Jesus who died shall be satisfied And earth and heaven be one Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, our world often seems to be a place filled with wrong But we know that it was not made to be that way Help us to see the beauty of in the world. Help us to see the image of God in every person we meet. Remove the sin that keeps us from seeing that everything in this world was created by you for good. Help us to be more like you, to be redeemers and not corruptors. Amen. Let's read from Job 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew That I may love what Thou dost love And do what Thou wast do Breathe on me, breath of God Until my heart is pure until my will is one with yours to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, so shall I never die. Believe with you the purpose to life for all eternity Sweet to trust. 
trust in Jesus Just to trust His cleansing blood And in simple faith to plunge me Neath the healing cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I proved Him o'er and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him more Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus simply taking Life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I prove him or and or Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh for grace to trust Him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and or Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Will you pray with me? Lord, we praise you for the redemption that you bring, not only to us, but to the entire world. Sin no longer has dominion over us because we are under your grace. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Before we look into the scriptures together, I want to thank you again all for your support and care for our family during the last couple of weeks. Certainly been a very trying time. Last Sunday didn't didn't have a virtual service uh, just because of, of everything that was going on. And this week is, is again, fairly simplified um, as we're just trying to keep things uh, surrounding the basics and, and the essentials of uh, scripture and, and worshiping God together. But I do want to thank you for your understanding and for your love and care. And certainly we want to continue to surround one another with prayer and with uh, the love of Christ uh, as we are his body here uh, in this little uh, corner of his kingdom. We're going to look at scripture together, and we're going to look at a couple of different passages. I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 2, which of course we are familiar with as the Christmas story, but you can turn there with me first, and then we're going to also eventually end up in the book of Philippians in the New Testament. I started thinking uh, really in the week uh, leading up to Christmas and when I was anticipating uh, sharing a message with you last Sunday and has only become more um, accurate in my own life probably this week, but I started thinking about the reality of waiting even after the good work has already begun. You know, in the weeks of Advent leading up to Christmas, we talked a lot about waiting. And we talked about those uh, Sundays and weeks where we were focusing on, on peace and on hope and on uh, joy and love and, and talking about kind of waiting for the coming of the Messiah that changes the entire landscape for a weary world. But then I realized something that I suppose I had known, but it just struck me in a fresh way uh, over Christmas, that even once the Messiah had come, the waiting continued. And so I want to talk to you today about this reality. Even when you are walking with God, even when he has done a good thing in your life, or you have asked him to do something in your life, and you know that he's there, what do we do when the waiting persists? And most importantly, coming to peace with the fact that that is a common experience in our walk with the Lord. 
In Luke chapter 2, we are very familiar with the first part of that chapter. The whole story about uh, Jesus being born, Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem, and the, um, the shepherds and the angels appearing, and it, there at the, uh, at the end of that part of the story in verse 20, the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. It then jumps forward eight days to Jesus being presented at the temple. His name was then called Jesus. This is verse 21, the name that had been given by the angel before he was even conceived in the womb. So Jesus is now eight days old. We're still in Luke chapter 2. That uh, text, that part of the story continues. And then as you come uh, down to the last third or so of Luke chapter 2, it talks about Jesus beginning to grow up as a child. And then all of a sudden, just jumping from verse 40 to 41, we are 12 years down the road in Jesus' life as his parents are preparing a trip to Jerusalem and Jesus is going to be coming with them as a 12-year-old. That part of the story lasts for about 11 or 12 verses to the end of chapter 2. And the screen goes blank again. And when chapter 3 opens we find that we are probably somewhere around Jesus being 29, 30 years old. So we went from his birth, over a decade down the road, we see him for a glimpse, and all of a sudden we have fast forwarded to another portion of his life, really about another 18 years down the road. And so the first about three decades of Jesus' life have passed. In a couple of chapters, boom, there they are. Nothing significant has happened, except that he was born of a virgin. All of the waiting that is talked about in the Old Testament, and the people walking in darkness, and the weariness, and the oppression, and the frustration that was there when the angels appeared, is still there 30 years later. The Messiah has been on the earth, living his life, Growing up, increasing in stature, and in his, his learning, his education, his, his livelihood as a carpenter. He's, all of these things have been going on, and the Messiah has been on planet Earth, and nothing really has changed from the people who are waiting for the Messiah. Especially around Christmas, we put so much emphasis on the birth of Jesus being born, and a little bit of emphasis on the waiting of Advent and then it's here and we celebrate and we rejoice in the newness of the gospel message being proclaimed again in the birth of Christ and looking forward to his death and resurrection because that's why he came. But realizing that for people who were experiencing it for the first time, even while he was there, the waiting continued. And then, as we read on through the gospel accounts, and we read how Jesus was living his life and the things that he was doing and how he was uh, living out his ministry, we find that it's not even what the people were expecting. He's not the kind of Messiah they thought that they needed. He's spending time with outcasts and sinners and folks who are not very popular. He's healing, yes, but he's healing in ways and, and with people that others really wouldn't want to give the time of day to. He's not taking a position of authority. He's not drawing a lot of attention to himself. He seems to disappear from places right when the crowds are gathering and really excited about his ministry. He moves on to the next place. Even in his baptism, when the heavens open and the dove descends and it seems like, ah, now's the time. It doesn't become what they think. You can indeed go all the way to the end of Jesus' ministry. And when they think that when he's riding in on the donkey on Palm Sunday, and they think, now's the time, and yet he doesn't do what they expect. And when he's hanging on the cross, and this is not what a Messiah is supposed to be, have we been wrong? And indeed, you could even say that when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended back into heaven, that there were a lot of people who had lived the entirety of the Messiah's life on earth and did not think that God had done what he had said he was going to do for them. The waiting, the desperation, the frustration, 
the sense of being overwhelmed even when God is in the picture. I think this is really important for us as we close 2020 and open 2021. The number of times that I have said and that you have said and we've heard many other people say, oh, this is the worst year, I just can't wait for it to be over, let's move into a new year. But of course the reality is all we did is flip the calendar from 2020 to 2021. All we did was move forward from one day to the next. All of the realities of the weary world are still around us. What does that mean? And what do we do about it? I want to turn your attention to Philippians chapter 1. Paul the Apostle is writing to the church at Philippi and he is thanking God for them and um, discussing their participation in the gospel, that, that the gospel has come and that they are learning from it and that they are uh, living it out from the, from the beginning of, of their understanding of it until this time that Paul is writing to them. And he says this in verse 6, I am confident of this very thing. This is the New American Standard, but it's similar in other versions. That he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He who began a good work, something has started, is going to perfect it or complete it or continue forming it until the day of Christ Jesus. These words stuck in my mind this week as I was thinking about the waiting even while the Messiah has come. Some of you today, at the beginning of 2021, are as desperate for God to do something in your life as you were a month ago or six months ago. Maybe it's an outward physical thing, maybe it's something internal, relational, financial, whatever it may be. And you're still waiting. Some of you may be confused about what you're waiting for. You're not even sure. You want to grow. You want God to do his work in you. You want to learn of him. You want to become more like him. You want to be faithful to him. But you're not exactly sure what he's doing or where he's leading. And Paul says, I am confident. I'm confident. My friends, we can be confident in what God is up to. We don't have to know what he is up to. I think back to Mary during those 30 years leading up to Jesus' first miracle. We know that she still had confidence that he was exactly who the angel had declared him to be. Because when they are at the wedding together, the wedding feast where he does that first miracle, she just says to the attendees, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. She knew Jesus was capable, but he hadn't done anything yet, really, to show he was the Messiah, but she knew. But I've wondered about her. The angel appears to her. The angel appears to Joseph. The angel appears to the shepherds. The shepherds come and worship. The wise men come. They take Jesus to a far land to protect him from those who would do him harm. He's raised. They do their best job with him as they could as human parents. And Mary is waiting because she knows that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Of all the people who knew that Jesus was there for a reason, Mary knew. But the waiting. And then you think of all the other characters in the story who too are waiting for God to finish or at least continue what he said he was going to do. So I want us to think today about what is it that God is up to even while we are still in what feels like a holding pattern. Let's start by asking the question, what is the good work? Paul says, I am confident. What am I confident of? That he who began a good work, he's already started the work. What is the good work? 
ultimately the work that God is doing in our lives is to make us in his image. You say, well, what about forgiveness? What about eternal life? What about, you know, the way that we live and behave and all those things? Yes, all of those are components. But if we go all the way back to the beginning, we find that God made man in his image. That's, what, that's how he started. With free will and eternal existence and eternal relationship with God himself. Because man sinned and fell and went his own way, a lot of that was broken and lost. We talked about that during our Advent series. And God has been in the business of remaking us in his image ever since. We need forgiven in order for that to happen. We need new life. We need to be brought back into the family, adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. We need our behaviors and our way of thinking and our very nature to be reformed, absolutely. Because we are shooting for the image of the divine God. So what is the good work that he's doing? He is interested in getting us back into his image in that eternal relationship with him. You see, in Jesus' day while he was on earth, there were all kinds of ideas of what a Messiah should be. Very few of them had anything to do with reclaiming the divine image of the one who had made them. It, they thought that it was more about status, more about uh, uh, power, more about their identity as, as children of Israel. But God had something bigger in mind. So what is the good work that he is interested in doing? Wherever you're at in that scope of relationship with him, he wants to continue to draw you into his own image and to make you after his likeness. Paul says not only is there a good work that he's started and that he's continuing to do, but he will complete it or perfect it or make it whole. He may not complete it today, but he is working at completing it today. The process continues on through today and tomorrow and this year and next year and however many years we have left. And can I say that we don't know what that amount of time is? The idea that we'll get serious about digging into our relationship with God at some point. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's that that's not the way to go about thinking these things through. He is completing it. How is he completing it? How is he perfecting it? What is he doing? When we enter into a relationship with Jesus, even at the very beginning, he who began the work, he begins to mold us back into the way that he thinks, the way that he sees things, the way that he behaves, the way that he interacts. He begins to mold us back by the power of his nature. And what we realize is we need more and more of him and less and less of me. He must increase, I must decrease, the scripture says. <clears throat> so he began a good work. He is continuing or perfecting or completing that good work, and Paul says he is completing it until the day of the Lord or until the day of Christ Jesus. So how long is this process going to take? The process will continue until one of two things happens. The day of the Lord's coming, his return, we talked during Advent about his first coming really pointing us to his second coming. Or, until our temporary time on this earth is over and we are rejoined with him for eternity. He continues to mold us, to make us, to form us. 
until our eternal reunion, whether it is here or there, earth or heaven. His coming here, our going there. He continues to work in us until that day. It doesn't matter what age you are. The work continues. Mary had things to learn about her son. The Israelite people had things to learn about their Messiah. And we continue to have things to learn about our Redeemer. But what are some practical things that we can see or, or learn or apply as we move into this new year of, of lessons that the Lord might be teaching us as he forms us more and more in his image? A few have come to my mind that I think are things we've learned from 2020 that we need to allow God to work in us as believers, as Christians, as we move into 2021. This is not an exhaustive list, but some that have come to my mind. First of all, Christians must be people of truth. There's been a lot of talk this year about truth. What's true? What's not true? Who can you believe? And everybody's got an idea and a, a thought and a, a perception on everything that's going on around them. Everyone's got a theory. And I am not going to try to get into today, I, I actually preached on this back during this year, about how do we determine truth and where we get our sources of truth. But Christians must be people who value truth. Not just truth that is convenient for them, not just truth that is uh, what they want to believe or that they think fits their narrative. Christians are not afraid to dig into truth, they're not afraid to be confronted with truth, and they're not afraid to stand for truth. And they're not afraid to admit when they were wrong. Truth is an important characteristic of Christianity. So that's one. Another thing that, <laughs> excuse me, another thing that came to my mind is that Christians must be people of love. If we value what is true, we also must value the ways that we interact with truth. And the primary truth is that God has created everybody. He's given us one another and we must love one another. This is how people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Love does not always just mean soft, gentle, just turning a blind eye to things. But love does mean faithful and true and steadfast and more concerned about the other person than I am about myself. Christians must be people of truth. They must be people of love. And then a third thing and a final thing that I would just throw out there today is that Christians must be people of grace and forgiveness. The world is yearning for people who will stand for what is true, but who will also be people who compassionately and lovingly look at their brothers and sisters, fellow humans, and extend grace and forgiveness and generosity. If we as a church do nothing else in the coming year, if we are people of truth and people of love and people of grace, we will change our community as we reach out to other people with the love of Jesus. The waiting is difficult. The timetable is not always what we have expected it to be. However, however, Jesus is completing. He is doing the work in us. He's forming us into his image. And that image is an image of truth and love and grace. And many other things, of course. But we can begin there as we see where he has to take us in the year to come. Lord, we thank you for the work that you are doing in us. And we thank you for your love and your grace and your truth. Empower us. Empower us to live lives that imitate you. We pray.
We love you. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for joining me today, my friends. May the Lord bless you. There will be no Bible study or after-service prayer time uh, for uh, today and this week. And we are going to hopefully pick some of those things back up. We are continuing to do virtual services for the foreseeable future. But thank you for joining us. May the Lord bless you as you go into this new year.